But we've also spent a lot of time in spaces where others have not got wide body passenger airplanes or freight markets. Those have been two markets where we spent a lot of time and we believe that there's a lot of value there. This is the Time on Wing podcast. I'm Courtney Miller. Welcome back. With me, as always, Garrick Deshavon. He's the guy from Collateral Verifications. Hello. Garrick, who are we talking to today? Today we're talking to Steve Rimmer. Steve Rimmer is currently the CEO of Altavair. Uh, very excited to speak with him. And they certainly have, I think, some uh, interesting strategies with uh, where they kind of put their money and with aircraft types. So I think it'll be really cool to get his take on what's going on. He's been, uh, he's well known in the industry. He's been around for some time. So it'll be very cool. Um, Steve's was... Uh, CEO of uh, Guggenheim Aviation Partners before that. He was also founder of XS Aviation uh, Limited. He was also the CEO of uh, Curtis & Company. Uh, he is a graduate uh, from the University of Central Lancaster with a degree in business studies. And he is also an investor at uh, Dirtfish Rally School, which is also very cool. Uh, we'll have to get his, uh, his, his thoughts on uh, what that is, because that's kind of cool. A little bit different. I've known Steve for, for some time based on the conference scene, so it'll be great to hear his views and how he got his start so steve this is your time on wing just a quick intermission before we continue with the show we do get a lot of questions about how our listeners can support the show and frankly the easiest way is to continue the spirit of the show which is just to reach out to us at conferences but we also run businesses as well and you can support us by supporting a lot of the work that we do you can uh, support the work that I do through Visual Approach by visiting visualapproach.io, where we produce a lot of research and analysis, a lot of data visualizations. From my side, obviously, I focus more on the metals. So anything that's you know aircraft related, uh, if you're looking for valuations, whether it's on aircraft engines, I'm happy to help with uh, any of those types of projects. Um, so we, we appreciate, you know, certainly the opportunities to, to work with all of you. And we certainly also appreciate just the fact that people are willing to listen to what we have to say and enjoy kind of our thoughts and takes on what we think is a fascinating industry. So thank you. Okay, back to the show. Well, Steve, thank you again for, for being on the Time Win Podcast. We, we do appreciate your time. Um, as I do with uh, with all of our fantastic guests, I, uh, I love to hear kind of how you got your start. Where did the passion for aviation come from? Um, so I'll kind of let you, you know, take it away and, and let, uh, let our audience and ourselves know kind of how you got started. Well, like a lot of my story, um, um, well, a lot of my story is about chance and being in the right place in the right time and and probably not putting enough thought into something. But um, my real start came from my upbringing. My father was an aircraft design engineer uh, with British Aerospace, BAC in those days, um, on the military side. And I, you know, I, I grew up listening about, listening about airplanes. I grew up understanding a little, not enough, obviously, of the technical side, because I'm not really that technical. Um, but the passion came from what was around the house every day. Um, you know, he'd come home and talk about airplanes. Um, he'd take me to air shows. Um, and it was almost in my blood. Um, so I didn't really have much choice about that, but I did enjoy it. And when it came to uh, post high school, looking at uh, going to what I did in uh, for undergrad, um, I got an opportunity offered by British Aerospace to go and join them as a what they called a senior commercial apprentice, which really meant that you worked for them for a year and then did three years undergrad degree and then another year working back with them. Um, and again, some things are by chance. After I'd finished that, um, working in the northwest of England, I was called in one day and said, look, there's a six months secondment available um, to, to go and work on this new program. And it, it, it would involve you relocating for six months or, or working remotely for six months. And I said, okay, that sounds interesting because the one thing that immediately clicked in my mind is my salary then was not great, but the one real money earning tax-free uh, element is your travel compensation. 
and you got paid per mile by using your own car. And I misheard where they said the location was going to be. I misheard Presswich. And I'm calculating in my mind, you know, that's 45 miles each way every day. And I came, I'm going to earn more than my salary and it's going to be tax free. So I didn't, that's great. Wait, I didn't wait for them to tell me what the, it was. I just said, yes. And it wasn't until they handed me two rail tickets and I said, why do I need rail tickets? Well, you're going to Presswick. Oh, that's 200 miles the other way. And I can't drive there every day. Um, but that became my introduction to the commercial side of, of aviation because at Press Week, I was sent up to help out with um, the project management side of trying to decide whether we launched uh, the Jetstream 31 commuter aeroplane. Oh, wow. I went for six months. I stayed for six years. I got involved with the commercial and sales side of, of that program. Um, and at the end of six years... I sort of thought, well, you know, what else next? And I've been working with a bank, Security Pacific Bank, um, and they said, well, why don't you come down and work for us? So without much thought, I said, yeah, that sounds fun. You know, the bank's salary is a lot bigger, and I'm going to work in London. And, and I joined Security Pacific on the banking side with them thinking I knew more than I did about asset values and leases, et cetera. Quit learning. Um, Spent some time in the uh, the aviation uh, banking side there. Um, enjoyed it, uh, but Security Pacific, I guess, decided that the California real estate crisis meant they should focus their attention back in California, and decided aviation wasn't a good place to be. So I actually left um, and and got into almost like a small boutique arranging uh, role with a company called Curtis and Company. I had one business partner, a lady who lived in San Francisco, who was XGATX, and I'd done business with her when I was at the bank. So did that, ended up doing engine leasing, ended up owning a few aeroplanes. And as I say, that, that went on. So the passion was there at the outset, but I kind of went down this black hole, not by design. Um, it was a lot of me not thinking of probably um, – crossroads in my career that I now look back and say, would I have ever made that decision again? And the answer is yes, just purely because I love aviation. Yeah, that's great. I didn't realize that you worked for, for a BE or, you know, or, or you kind of got, got started there with the, with the whole digest stream stuff. That's really cool. You know, you know, you talked about maybe being able to edit. I'm not sure I'm that proud of being <laughs> employed by BA. I'm joking. <laughs> 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 there are it, it seems like every time i turn around you know we talk to uh, chris jones andy shanklin right all yeah. all had their start with no, I, with I, british I, aerospace it like some of these things you say you know it taught you what how not to do things right <laughs> much of a learning experience is knowing how to do things and um no but it, it was it was a great learning experience for me uh, i wouldn't replace it at all yeah 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 so um so how did you transition from kind of going from curtis and company and then uh i think you started excess aviation uh after that what what was that transition like again um crossroads which were um where a lot of actually a lot of thought went into that one um well, we we started Curtis Power Company, uh, Lynn Butch and my partner and I. Um, so in parallel to Curtis and Company, we started Curtis Power Company back in 1991 by thinking that here we're earning some fees, um, but we don't have enough money to put back into owning assets, aircraft assets that give us credit diversity and asset diversity. So what's the next highest capital value asset that we, uh, we could invest in? And 1991, um, we started buying engines. Uh, first two engines were a couple of JT90s, uh, um, uh, 7F uh, from South African Airways, which we bought, um, upgraded to 7Js and leased to Virgin Atlantic. And during my days at Security Pacific, I got to know Virgin Atlantic pretty well. We financed the first four airplanes for them. Uh, and, and so I was able to sort of arbitrage the knowledge of the airline, a little bit of knowledge on engines, and, and 
we we bought those two engines and leased them to Virgin. Um, then we said, well, you know, let's grow it. We can get some credit diversity, asset diversity. And we built it um, from like 91 through 98 when um, basically it became the bulk of our earnings. We were still doing some consultancy work, some remarketing work on aircraft, fee earning business, um, but engines became pretty core to us. Uh, in 98, we said, okay, we've spent all the equity we have. We got about 10 engines by that stage, <laughs> not huge. Um, uh, we need a partner. And we found, we, we looked at financial partners and then found GE, who surprisingly enough, at that point in time, and maybe history is going to start repeating itself there, but they, they said, look, uh, more often than not, if somebody needs to lease an engine, it's because we've screwed up. There's a warranty claim, and the the you know the the engine we've delivered isn't working, um, and we we want to get into this really um, uh, the the whole scale of 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 taking care of the engine. So we'll sell the engine, we'll sell a maintenance contract, and we'll provide leased engines as part of that. But if we go through the door and say we're going to lease you an engine as part of that deal, the airlines will probably say you know, guys, it's your fault. I don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So they said they wanted to put their toe in the water on the engine leasing business, but they didn't want their name out there. So they kind of used us as a cover. They bought 43% to Curtis Power Company and and said, okay, let's see how it goes. So between 98 and 2001, um, we ended up adding probably about 45, er uh, 45 engines, um, at which point, better lucky than good. In January 2001, they said, well, let's exercise the option to buy the other 57%. Well, I worked oh, wow. out in January 2001. I'm not sure it worked yeah. but, uh, in October 2001, as lucky as it did there. So I said, better lucky than good. That caused Lynn and I uh, to go our separate ways. Uh, my partner in Curtis and Company, her husband had sold his venture capital company. They didn't have kids. So she went her separate way and it started me thinking, okay, what next? And, um, you know, I, life is about people as much as it is about metal. And uh, Paul Newrick, who you guys might know, had worked with me at British Aerospace. He worked with me at Security Pacific. Uh, and he was in transition. And I said, well, let's, let's start something new. Um, so again, in sort of February, uh, 2001, we started Curtis and uh, we started Excess Aviation. Um, and of course, that stagnated a little bit after 9 11 because there were, even though we'd got some equity out of the sale of the engine business, there wasn't a lot to invest in between 2001 and 2003. So we, in 2003, went out and, and looked for some equity because uh, we realized the business had changed a little bit. You know, no longer a phone and a fax, and you could do anything you wanted, really. You know, you needed some capital. Um, teamed up with Guggenheim Partners um, in 2003, raised our first equity fund um, in 2004. Uh, we ultimately sold out of that, uh, raised another equity fund with Guggenheim Partners in 2006, 2007. Um, and we're managing that with, when in parallel. Guggenheim Partners said in 2007, 2008, um, look, we're managing money for insurance companies. It's cheaper to buy the insurance company than compete for the fees to manage the capital. So they went off and bought five insurance companies, at which time, you know, it, we were we were investing some of the insurance company money as well. And, it, you know, the regulators uh, didn't like really an in-house private equity company investing insurance capital. I mean, this is right after this is right after AIG and that whole right or in yeah. that area. Yeah. So, so when you get the regulators looking over your shoulder all the time, Guggenheim partners decided it's, it's, it's probably good. We, we, we like you. We'd want to continue investing with you. And we still have a, some assets, which we manage for Guggenheim today, believe it or not. Um, but in, in 2016, basically said, Let, let's go our separate ways amicably. Um, we bought back Guggenheim's 50% share in what was then Guggenheim Aviation Partners. 
Um, and we spent sort of 2016 through 2018 saying, what next? Um, again, realizing that although we were doing some separate managed accounts uh, with, with certain clients, we needed some significant capital uh, to, to be relevant in the business. And um, we did about an 18 month dance with KKR, eventually got married at the end of 2018. Um, uh, and started investing in 2019 when they gave us a uh, billion dollars of capital uh, to invest, which we levered. Um, uh, they own 50% of the platform now. Um, and since then, we've, we've, we've fully invested that original billion dollars. We're in the process of investing another billion, uh, 150 right now. We're about, about 500 million invested. Um, we've got about 122 aeroplanes. Um, and probably about 12 engines. Um, and, you know, we're onwards and upwards. We're about 50 people in the platform. Um, a lot of people here in Seattle, uh, but we built an office in, in Dublin, a leasing office in Dublin, which has got 15 people. Um, but KKR has been a wonderful partner and given us access to a lot of different capital. So uh, we've got the what you would more say is the typical um, alternative uh, capital, which he looks for a 12 to 15% IRR. But KKR also bought an insurance company, Global Atlantic. Uh, history repeats itself a little mm -hmm. bit there. Uh, but that gives us some access to some, to some equity um, from the insurance company. But more importantly, it allows us to start it, uh, um, a debt company. So uh, we, we, we've got a, an office in a separate office in Dublin because we keep the businesses separate because, um, you know, from CIT days, et cetera, lending to other leasing companies, you know, the leasing companies want to know that their trade secrets aren't being uh, read across to, you know, our business, our leasing business. So we've got a separate business there. Um, uh, so we've, we've now got two offices in Dublin with about 30 people spread between them. Um, and KKR, as I say, has been a great partner. We see a long pipeline of um, available equity um, uh, and debt capital. So it, it's been quite the ride, so to speak. So I, you have quite the history. I think I'll I'll start there. Um, but in so you've had similar kind of you said the cycle repeats itself i think i i really i'm really drawn to that because the cycle has repeated itself several times for you right you've you've raised you've had successful deployments uh and then you've you've done it again um you know curtis xs uh guggenheim aviation partners now altavere through your experience if i divide if if i separate the business uh of of kind of aviation investing and the capital raise and kind of knowing the airplanes and, and the deployment, how would, how would you describe kind of where you excel or what, what would you call the most important part of, of what, what made you successful in, in these roles? Um, I would say team, um, We've had consistency. We've got people here that have been working together as a team for 15, 20 years. Um, and that consistency is, is hard to replicate. It's also hard to replicate the expertise that I, I believe we've got as a team. So, you know, I think we've been successful because we've been able to demonstrate as a team a track record and the same people doing it again. So you're not losing anything along the way. We, we, we've been fortunate. We've not had people, um, you know, go off in different directions. However, we are getting older. So that's, that's, a, that's an issue. <laughs> Which, uh, but um, uh, it's the alternative. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and this industry can do that to you as well. <laughs> More than well yeah. aware of that. Oh, yeah. But I think it's team and, and, and the knowledge of that team. I think where we haven't moved away from is the asset. Um, there's a lot of movement in our industry towards what I'll say is spreadsheet investing. And 
and it's whatever the spreadsheet says is right. And if I change that column or that row, and by the way, there's a rule in this in, in our in our house here. Somebody can give me a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet once. If they give it me again or a second one, they're out of here. I, I work on PDFs. I don't understand spreadsheets, et cetera, which is probably where where I would say is I think a lot of it's about the asset. It's about the knowledge of what you're investing in. And sure, we can put a lot of fancy analysis around this whole thing, but if you get the asset wrong, then none of it works. So I think this team has the expertise and experience um, to understand the asset. That's both in terms of understanding what it is and understanding what it can be. And, and what it can be can be positive and negative. You know, um, engine, being involved in the engine market, you know, engines are a big number in this. Uh, so it, we, we understand the totality of it, we like to think, but we've also spent a lot of time um, in spaces where others have not gone um, or didn't want to go because it's not the commodity. You can't turn it over quickly. Um, and whether that's, you know, wide body passenger airplanes or, or freight markets, those have been two markets where we spent a lot of time and we believe that uh, there's a lot of value there. Um, and I think that's probably a differentiating factor because what it does, it's also, it also makes the business interesting. So I think one of the reasons we kept everybody together is, is about the business we're doing. It's interesting, it's changing, and it's a lot of touching. It's not a lot of spreadsheets. This begs the follow on question. I've asked several people this, but I feel that I, I must, I'm, I'm being compelled to ask you, when will your book be published and how can we get it? <laughs> oh gosh, no. <laughs> More exciting things to, to be said before I get to write something down. But I would say, I mean, there's never a dull moment, right? And the good news, I, I had the privilege early um, when I was at Security Pacific of, because we were the big lender to, on, on 4747s at, at the start of Virgin Atlantic, I had the privilege of, um, of being around on certain internal discussions which an outsider should never have been involved in on the aircraft side, certainly not their banker, um, and, and observe that you know, you had Richard Branson, who would come into meetings, and he'd had this huge, you know, index of things he wanted to go through, ideas which you know people would you know, just go, oh no, not this one. Um, but surrounded by a team of people, but the, the people there, they took the the level of uh, diversity that Richard brought to the table, ideas. And they filtered through them and then went out and they got to work on such, such interesting things. And that's a little bit like us, I think, um, because you know some of our colleagues. There's a lot of interesting ideas bouncing around here. Um, and I, I get blamed for a lot of them, um, or at least the bad ones. But, uh, but people around here um, are free to go and explore different things. That's what I, I hope we've created, a, a, an atmosphere where people can go and explore and look at different things. And it, it makes, it, it gives a, a reward, I think, to people. I think that's what has, has kept us where we, we are. And that will produce, I think, just to, to cover it off, I think that will produce some very interesting stories. Um, it's a lot, it's a, I sometimes think that the, the reality show, if we'd have shot it, would have made far more money than staying in aviation and investing. I you agree. It, listen, I'm not <laughs> asking. Right, yeah. I'm not asking if you have stories to write a book. I'm telling you, <clears throat> you have stories, Steve. Yeah. Write a book. I, for instance, the idea of uh, interesting projects as kind of a, a retainment strategy or a, 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 I'll call it loyalty, I'll call it culture, right? That, that employee level that doesn't get talked about enough, especially for people who are as terminally addicted to cool things with wings as any of us in aviation, right? 
yes. we're only here because this is interesting. So to attack that and to cons- yes, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> man, so that I mean, whatever's behind me, you just trump everything that's behind me. I, I mean, think that was a come setup. On. I think you got set up, Garrick. That wasn't set up. I tried <laughs> the background, yeah. But yeah, but, you were just waiting for that one to be like, all right, now is now the moment. I think now's the moment. Here we go. What's I, next? I, and you know, that is all about. You, you know, there are certain people in this industry who, you, you know, you you just so enjoy being around them, not and not just in your team. That was something that John Ferron found in his brother's garage when he was cleaning it out about six months ago. And I think because John and I went to so many Seahawks games because I have season tickets there and he likes it and he likes that. I think that was probably my payment for his season ticket, sharing my season ticket for a year with the Seahawks. You, but you, he, you got the better of that deal. Yeah. <laughs> like, how many of you know? You know, you think about collectors' items and how much. Yeah. I, I sort of half debated. I wonder what I get if I put that on eBay. Um, a lot, a know, lot. Or, or more importantly, how much of a tax write-off would I get if I donated it to iStat? There you go. Or something like that, you know. It's like, how can I get an appraiser to value the model and come up with that's worth three million, Steve? So you, you know, you can have a tax expense of that. It, yeah, I know, I know an appraiser. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think especially if you can get a sign from somebody that was relevant at that time. Yeah, you know, from whoever on the design team or. Yeah, I mean that that's that's history right there, right? All that yeah. stuff. Um, and you know the the point that you make, which which I find, and that's why. I really don't call it work when I travel uh, to conferences and everything else. And unfortunately, my wife knows that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like you, you you make longtime friends in this industry. And it's not just, you know, you're not just working with people. You're you you end up doing things with people and you do things for each other because you've worked on projects or you've worked like you've done so many things together that it's kind of like a it's like family. Right. You're all like, a, you know, band of brothers or whatever you want to call it. It's it's amazing to me, right? Every everywhere you go, you talk to people, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know what? I just we did this trip with these people, or you know, I played golf with this person, or yeah, we just had dinner because I was in town." Like it to me is astounding, and it's great. It's great. That's one of the things I love about this industry. Yeah, it's, it is about people. As I said, we we love the we love that we focus on the asset and, and, and the core of this, but it's about people. And you know, when you grow a business, that the, the the thing about it is what's that cutoff point where, you know, a family is really a tough culture to keep going. You know, we're at like 50 people right now. And, and I, I, I honestly feel that I, I don't get to spend as much time as I want with everybody. Um, that might, they might be happy not spending time with me, but I, I'm, I, I, I would like to really know, you know, what they're thinking and what, what motivates them and not just in a business sense, you know, families and stuff like that. We, it, it, it's, it's a fabulous industry, fascinating industry. The travel part of it, I, I got to say, I used to like it a lot more than I do today. You know, um, you know, I'm not as incentivized to go traveling today, except it's the only way I see people. And, and that's more about, why I travel or, or why I, why I do do look to travel today. Um, it's the people. There's been a lot of talk, I mean, really over the past decade plus over kind of the commoditization of the industry, a lot of capital flooding in uh, to leasing that, you know, when you first started, I, I think we could still call the, the industry a, a bit nascent. Um, you know, in kind of the mid '90s, there before before leasing really kind of stretched its legs, um, and and it's something you said really kind of stuck with me, especially as we're kind of moving into that kind of post commoditization period where there's probably just so much capital, high interest rates, and it's the spreadsheet, right? And we've seen it. I mean, Garrick and I have talked about this several times. We can make any deal work just by fudging the residual value. 
um, and you see it, right? Y y you know when it happens. You see the deals where clearly they're assuming this thing's gonna gonna come back at at a high residual value. What do they care? They won't be in that position at that point anyway. That's one thing, yeah. Uh, but the idea of uh, this is, I truly think this gets missed often. And me, I'm a spreadsheet guy, right? I'm modeling all sorts of things. I'm in the data all the time. Um, but what gets missed is exactly what you said. It, it's it's the not narrative, not story. It's the why. It's the you know what's really going on behind the scenes. You probably have enough years of experience to take a look at a deal and smell hair on it right away, right? To be like, hmm, I saw something you know maybe ten years ago that that reminds me of this i'm a little a little cautious no spreadsheet's going to have that yeah. how do you how do you deal with the commoditization of the industry today to really highlight that that kind of edge and that value that you bring that's that's beyond it right that, that, that's just beyond the numbers so i think at the outset you've got to look at the capital that you're investing. And we spend a lot of time, as I said, we, you know, you track record. So the track record of the team is fortunately such that people can see that we've not just, we've changed residuals. They didn't, I didn't get there. You know, our, 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 as a team, our performance has been um, something that's allowed us to keep on raising capital. But so much of what, uh, what we do today is about, the education we go through in the cap with the capital up front and you know kkr we as i said literally dance with them for 18 months best 18 months we ever spent because it, it allowed us to ensure we're on the same page hmm. because if you're going to get beyond the spreadsheet it's hard to do that on a deal by deal basis you know you, you need to have Build that relationship so that when 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 that moment comes and says, "Yeah, that's what the spreadsheet says," but I don't I, I don't believe it because of this. It's hard to do on a one-off basis. It, it it goes back to where you start with the relationship, and really have a partner who's comfortable with doing that. Guggenheim were totally hands off. I we started off, we did the education. But we were almost cocktail party chatter for Guggenheim, who were busy, you know, raising big amounts of money. And but look, we're different. We've got an aircraft leasing hmm. uh, platform. You know, KKR was much more focused uh, and, and much more um, diligent in, in. I'm not undermining K uh, uh, Guggenheim because we went through a lot of diligence, but KKR were way more focused, way more educated in the space they'd been in the abs market um you know they'd had some other joint ventures before um so we ha we spent a lot of time actually going through and saying look we look at the asset space like this um and yes the numbers follow but but sometimes the other way around the numbers don't portray what what really is the underlying here um and, and i think we still struggle, don't get me wrong, you know, because when the spreadsheet says something, it's not easy to put your finger in the air and say, yeah, but. But there's a lot of trust and a lot of, uh, there was with Guggenheim, they, they were totally hands off. KKR, uh, over the last five years of, you know, our, our JV with them, um, you know, they've, they've grown, they've understood, and they now are starting to understand when we come in and say, yes, but. Um, that it's there. I think if if you ask me, the technical department around here is like unbelievable in terms of you think if they get it right, um, it's a huge upside. If they get it wrong, it's an equally huge downside. And so one of the things I always ask is, you know, technically, am I thinking of this right? Uh, and particularly, it comes around to a lot of his engines and maintenance condition. Um, and, you know, let's get our heads around that because we think there's an arbitrage there. And then you, you go into the bigger scenario, which is 
how can we really differentiate ourselves and give those differentiated returns? Well, we've got to do something different like freight conversions. And that's something scary to people because when you put a 777-300ER investment on the table and you do 22 of them with Etihad and say, don't worry, there'll be a freight conversion because that's one of my three exits. It's released as a passenger, oh, the engines are worth something. Oh, but it's a great, it's gonna be a great freighter platform. That's where I think, you know, the real trust comes. Because you, you can say, I'm not gonna do anything to the asset, but I think it's gonna be worth 20% more than the appraisers say, so let's take a higher. That doesn't really work that often. You know, I mean, sometimes maybe. Um, but it's when you start digging in and saying, I'm going to repurpose something. Or, you know, on a single aisle, I know those CFM 56-7s are going to be worth more because of, look at this dynamic in, in, the, in the used engine market. Um, and look at what the LLP prices are doing. You know, there's no way CFM and, and GE are going to take their foot off of the gas from charging 11% increase per annum on LLPs because it's a big number for them. See, it, it's those sort of things that allow allow people to say, okay, now I understand. It's not just purely gut. There is some, there's some history, there's some understanding there. But it, it takes time, and you, you can't um, – it, it's hard to go in and say, trust me, we've been there before. We still have to have data behind it. Yeah, yeah but that's uh, – I, I – I've totally resonate with this right this is playing chess right as opposed to checkers right it's the idea of considering things like i got you know i use the term game theory but that's exactly what this is right okay if llps are escalating at 10 plus percent per year what does that mean for the residual value of these engines right well the stuff that's in them are going to be worth more yeah 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 so something where you know when we talk about industry today i there's a lot of those discussions to be to be had i think yeah yeah, yeah absolutely I'll, go ahead garrick i'll keep going on i know on. i know you are i'm, <laughs> I'm trying to no so i, I was going to ask so how do you um when you think about the the new or the younger generations right that's coming through your shop right how do you instill that mindset of not just taking things for granted based on a spreadsheet Right, which is, I think, a lot of the younger generation is, right, they're very bright, they come out of school, they know all about financial modeling and all this stuff, but yet, you know, I think a lot of times when you're fresh out of school, you know, you ask them, okay, so what is that spreadsheet telling you? What does it really mean? No clue, right? But they can do the numbers. Yeah. So how do you instill that mindset of like, oh, you know what, I, I, need, to, I need to know more. I need to know why this, this means this or why, what it really, what's behind it. Uh, how do you kind of get that culture at set in your in your shop well i think we've been fortunate right now i mean if you look at the succession uh, and and the team below the team below me um they've been there a long time so they've seen it already um they've seen you know the experience of the tech group the legal group you know and, and uh, all the, the aspects of it but getting down to that next level it's a question of do we have enough time to spend doing that because it's so easy. If, if, if there's a space where we've lost people, um, it's lost people at the lower, uh, the, the entry level where, you know, you're in Seattle, you know, Amazon's down the road, Microsoft's across the road, you know, um, you know, the, there's, there's people who, you know, if they're not passionate about the industry can go and, and plow their wares elsewhere. So it, it really is spending time with them. But, but there has to be, um, I think, patience with them because it's not going to come overnight. It, it's, uh, and, and spending time um, in a, an informal environment with them uh, and explaining why uh, this has to happen. It's really hard. It really is hard. And it's, a, it's an art that we're going to lose if we're not careful as an industry because we're going to get taken over by spreadsheets uh, at every level. Um, you know, you, you, we can probably talk about engine OEMs, but, you know, the engine OEMs 
are being run by people who aren't from our industry. And, and you know, so we, we're trying to build people up to, to, to have it. And then at the top of our industry, spreadsheets are becoming the only thing that matter. You I'm know, gonna I, dis- I, I'm going to disagree a little bit. Um, okay. And it's not an actual disagreement, but it is. Um, but it's not. I agree with the trend and exactly what you're saying, Steve, but I still firmly believe, mostly because I built a business on it, uh, and I have to believe it, that that there is always, I used, I overuse the term edge, but I've seen it like through this industry so much, the people who are able to, to take a step back, whether that be from the spreadsheets, like you said, you love the PDF, like that's, that's the jam, right? Because that's, that's the the big picture that that's what you deal in there's always somebody who's able to do that and that person will excel right that group that team will will excel um ooh that's that's not probably the best word for excel is probably not the best word to use for not working with spreadsheets but you get the <laughs> idea <laughs> I, nice up above me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i but i do i i still think so the first aircraft deal i ever did i don't know if you know the the gentleman uh guy by the name of john binder in calgary with, yeah. with avmax and i it, it was i didn't realize again it was my first deal i didn't realize how unique it was to work with somebody like that like what you're describing the idea of the person mattering and you know <laughs> he he uh he made a big deal of making sure that you know we shook hands and you know looked looked each other in the eye when we shook hands and it was a very old school deal and i didn't realize how unique it was there are, i i firmly believe there are always people who are let me put it this way if if that art gets lost what a, what an advantage for somebody who has it and i think they'll fill it i really do i i think like you said, I think it'll come. I think it'll come back. I don't think it will ever be completely lost because there's too much money to be made by having that vision. Uh, really, that I that I think the the last what thirty years plus is has kind of built built to your story a little bit. Yeah, and, and if you look at it, you know we're, we're all looking for bumps in the road when people realize, yeah. you know the things like that you know whilst you're stable or you know or you, you don't think you can put a foot wrong you know I mean, it's like uh, you know people don't turn and say look the spreadsheet had said that but it turned out this way um but i think it's a i think it's critical certainly in our in our segment of the market it's very critical because we're not really the commodity and, and it, we will lose position um and ability to deliver if we don't have that mindset and the people coming through don't have that mindset, I, th- I think it's really important. Um, and you know, bigger isn't always better. Uh, I know. Agreed. 50 was a scary number for me for a number of employees. I mean, it's like, okay, um, that's big, you know, it's not, but, um, but maintaining that, um, that same mentality, that same, uh, approach is, is difficult. I can't tell you how many times, and certainly in the past couple of years, I've heard the uh, comment that, look, aircraft leasing is purely an arbitrage game. You've got the cost of cost of funds, and you've got the, the lease rates and, and the return on the leases. And if the cost of fund goes up, then the industry is screwed. And I do not agree with that whatsoever, because exactly what you're explaining here, the business businesses that you've built rely on kind of that that edge again to to overuse the term um but it's and you you answered another question that i had is where does that edge start from and i think you kind of you really mentioned the technical team and really understanding the metal and the assets and and i think i guess the point i'm making is um will ebb and flow but if you're right and i agree with you 100 percent that that edge is there like we do need to know this business inside and out, somebody will fill that gap. And it may be bigger at times than, than others. Um, again, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really disagreeing with you here. <laughs> but I, but I also think it's taking that and looking forward because, you know, one thing's for sure, the future won't 
represent what the past was. There's yeah. a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of things that will carry through, but they'll carry through differently. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, so we've got to take that and be able to look forward as well. You know, I mean, when we're projecting forward, I mean, when we looked, um, uh, you know, a triple seven three hundred ERs. Um, a lot of it was about the G90 engine and where was that going to be? You know, um, we had to get down to that level. Uh, and, and during COVID, it was, okay, how do we protect ourselves going forward? We we might need engines. Look at the engine, you know, what's happening in the engine servicing shops? You know, you know what's going on with engine part production? And it, it's that sort of thing to say, okay, here we are. Let's take what we've seen in the past. We know there's going to be problems. Let's provision for it. Um, now there's a couple of more dynamics I think that we're looking at in the industry that are that, that are going to be key to success going forward. And yeah, I did mention about you know the engine OEMs, but you know this is a cyclical business, right? You know the the, the it ebbs and flows. Um, what I would say is that um, we've not seen it as much in the last decade as, or, or post-COVID as we thought we might do. I mean, the airlines have stayed relatively strong. If you think about, you know, the demand side for airplanes is still pretty strong. The financing side for airplanes is still pretty strong. Supply side is not good. So therefore, demand and supply are a little imbalanced. And you look at whether you look at um, interest rates or you look at inflation or you, you, and you think about, well, surely that's going to cause a problem. Um, I, you, you say to yourself, well, what are the OEMs going to do about it? What can they do about it? You know, they can't increase supply. Um, where you're at right now is a, a situation that, I think we've never been at before. Um, I had an investment banker say to me last week that, you know, look, um, uh, I ought to just publish their their profit figures for the airlines. And I, was it 50 billion or whatever? I, I can't remember the absolute number. Um, and everybody's jumping from the hilltop saying, look, it's great. Um, well, the truth of the matter is if you compare that to, you know, <laughs> the turnover of the airlines, it's minuscule. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's not really something to be shouting at, um, but the airline balance sheets are, are are still relatively strong. I mean, Scott Kirby did the uh, you know that podcast last week and um, uh, and said you know he, he projected a lot of pe a, a lot of a lot of airlines have been sustained um, when they shouldn't have been because they didn't get their airplanes on time and because. The OEMs are paying them compensation for aeroplanes, which if they had got them, then they'd be bankrupt, you know, because they've got too much capacity. Um, when you look at that and that dynamic of where we are, of demand, supply, um, and financing, it's a lot different today than it's been in the past. And I think if you fast forward, it's going to be a lot different in the future. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of flood of capital into this market I would say some of it very uneducated, but it's here and it needs to be deployed. So is financing going to dry up? I think it might change, you know. Um, you know, you got Basel IV and some of the regulatory um, uh, charges that might make the traditional banking sector a little bit, um, a little bit challenged. Um, but we've got alternative lenders. I mean, we're, we're lending into, into the space. Um, you've got the Brookfield Castle Lake thing, which is going to bring a lot of insurance equity in, into the capital into the market, which is probably going to end up some of it going to be in the debt side of the business. Um, and you've got a lot of equity coming into the business, whether it's sovereign wealth funds, pension uh, funds, insurance companies, which is, lo is looking for, it doesn't need as high a return. Um, the banks, the, the airlines balance sheets are, are, are going to stay... I think pretty healthy generally in the near term. I mean, United had a six billion dollar capex budget for this year, and I think they spent it's now four billion because of lack of aircraft coming in. So you're going to see a lot of change, I think, in dynamic there in 
in in what what happens in the near term. Um, and for us, it's like, well, what else is going to come along? This is actually we were Garrick and I were discussing this before you joined. It's it's one of the research I'm publishing this um, this month. Actually, is the wave of uh, sale lease back over trades that will be available to the airlines. We're only in the middle of it, right? So if we if we consider orders before 22, let's assume let's assume uh, an OEM escalation cap of two and a half percent. Probably middle of the road for airlines placing orders before pre pre pandemic and and middle of the pandemic. Well, those escalation caps are paying out, which means that the value of these aircraft that have not yet delivered are increasing much higher than their escalation. Not to mention any OEM delivered delays are gonna be escalation friendly. Right. If it if it's on them. So that means that we have a wave of aircraft delivering to these airlines that's worth more than they're paying. Right. It's this forward looking wave of overtrade opportunity. Now, again, it, it, it comes down to the individual contracts that they negotiate, but we can make some pretty round number assumptions to say airlines such as I remember the frontier is the is the airline right now that everybody has got everybody talking about SLB overtrade because they're bringing like $12 million in airplane last quarter over what they're paying for it in the, in the SLB side. Now, whether or not the lessors should be signing that different, it's a, whatever that, whatever that contract is, uh, whatever that lease is, is, but for frontier, there's value there. And that value goes to the balance sheet to your point. Exactly. Right. This is something we've never had to consider in this magnitude before, right? So even as much as time cycles and, and we go through those ebbs and flows, the the trick is identifying what's part of the cycle and what's outside of it. Like, what are the assumptions we can't make anymore? And I think that's where your comment about the, the spreadsheet really kind of just has a, a ton of merit into determining what assumptions will continue and what cannot we assume anymore yeah and, and and certainly with new aircraft you hope that on a sale lease back that's going to be 10 or 12 years if the industry hasn't sorted itself out by that stage we're in all all in the deep proverbial but when you look at the the shorter term stuff which the airlines would normally do to manage you know the existing aeroplanes i mean the tendency i think is um for the airlines not to do those short-term sale leasebacks because then they expose themselves to having re-deliver airplanes in a certain mm -hmm. condition. Then you've got the MRO risk, you've got the engine risk, you've got the airframe risk, and, and that's where all things aren't created equal. You know, if you look at it, I think the low-cost carriers who typically don't have any in-house MRO capability, um, they, they always thought they could get MRO capability third parties now the big guys are taking yeah. that and all of a sudden the cost and availability is going up there but coming back to it the airlines are not willing to, they're still capable because they're not spending money on new airplanes to keep assets on balance sheet longer because they don't know how to quantify the risk of returning an airplane um i just think that exposure is something in their minds so then that you know what do you have to do to make that work, um, you know, you, as a leasing company, are you prepared to take that extra step and say, look, I'll lower the re-delivery condition. You pay me this amount of cash, lower it enough that the airline can say, okay, I know I'm gonna be able to meet that or take a C check out. You don't have to do that engine overhaul and just give me cash instead, just give the lessor cash. How many people are prepared to do that? Because the lessor is then going to have to go and arrange it, and they're going to have to fight for that same capacity. So it brings the lessor into say, how much risk do I really want to take to win the business? Um, you know, the longer term sale leasebacks, where as I say you should be through the market where the MRO and, and support is, you know, is through the worst of it. You're going to compete against the lowest cost of capital that's out there. Uh, and you're not going to get a return. So are you, are you forced into that 
sort of secondary market and to be successful in that secondary market, what risk do you have to take and how do you hedge that risk? You, you mentioned you don't like hedging, but you know, what hedging do you have to take? Um, I, I, I fully agree with that. I, I mean, the, um, Look, in a fully commoditized market, let's just use the S&P 500, right? We could assume that that's just fully commoditized, uh, just buying the SPY. Um, you can still sell options and, and make money off of that. Why? Because the value's in the beta. The value's in, in the risk. Like, you take yeah. on risk, you get value. So then where can you where can you excel? Like, where can you actually kind of house and, and credit that value? And the answer is in managing the risk. And it sounds like exactly... You know, how do you manage the risk in the leasing business? The technical side, you know, uh, re-delivery conditions, you know, the potential outcomes. Um, You know, one of the things you mentioned that really stuck out to me uh, just now is it occurred to me the way you think you you think in terms of the airline CEO sitting in front of his board like, the problems he has and and how is he personally going to deal with those problems as opposed to what are the cost of funds? How can I kind of sneak a return in? Um, I find that fascinating. I also don't see that type of thinking enough by my. By and there will be a time when it has to come, but right now I, I think right now all the forces tend to suggest that they, Airlines don't need to do it. I mean, I think Scott Kirby is right that a lot of airlines have been saved because the airplanes they ordered didn't deliver. And guess what? They didn't need them. Uh, but the other side of it is there's some, well, there's some sort of coupon being ri- written for them, um, you know, to to compensate. The big airlines, I think, I think I'm correct in saying that United makes some sort of statement that they get future credits instead of cash today for mitigation from Boeing from the latest round of things. But the, the smaller airlines have probably been getting cash. Um, so then the question comes is, do we really know the full impact of what we're dealing with today with all these delays? You know, you know, are the manufacturers really reporting the absolute impact on them, and what impact does that have on future development of aeroplanes, on pricing of aeroplanes? You know, we've got this roll-up, which I don't think we're through yet, and and it comes back a lot to to saying you've got to look at the totality uh, of the business. Um, I'm I'm not going to pretend that we're, you know, geniuses and can second-guess the CEOs of major airlines, but... I mean, we're spending a lot of time sitting back and saying, what does this really mean? Because that's the basis for what we're going to invest in now. Um, You know, we invested in engines. Should we invest more in engines? Um, You know, do you what what should you be looking at? Well, if I'm Scott Kirby, too. I mean, he's making the argument I should get my airplanes and they shouldn't get their airplanes. I mean, like, uh. Okay, I well, mean, if you, look at the, isn't it? <laughs> if you look at the Mexico market, it's fascinating right now. Um, uh, Valaris and Viva Airbus both are having serious trouble keeping airplanes. And they are GTF issues, right? Uh, right? Delivery delays, all the same things, right? But they both have the same, very similar fleets, so they're having very similar problems. They're also both incredibly profitable because capac- the overall supply has been constrained. In a weird way, the OEMs are saving the airlines from themselves, and they don't want to. The OEMs don't want to. They want to. They want to feed out the crack as quickly as they'll smoke it, right? Um, but but the Mexican aviation market is doing quite well because of the OEM delays. How well would the U.S. market be doing if if United got all their airplanes? But then if United got all their airplanes, that means that American did too, and that means that Southwest did too, and that means that Spirit and Frontier and Right. It, it, so it, it all plays together. But if I'm Scott, I say those things anyway. I, I, I don't. It, it just seems like a messaging on my from my perspective. It's dynamic. It's a dynamic that's yes. not going to overnight. Right. We'll be dealing with this, you know, for the next three, four or five years, because even if you get the top OEM sorted, that's the worst case, to be honest with you. If Boeing get up to 52, 58 airplanes a month and Airbus are up at 72 on single hours. 
The problem is the next layer is the, 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 the same supplier supplying both of them who hasn't got a chance in hell of keeping up with that pace. Um, and, you know, they don't have the investment, they don't have the liquidity to do it. And um, I say, if the piper hasn't been paid up at the top yet, because when aircraft start delivering, they start delivering at an even lower price because people cash in their, you know, um, you know, their chips on uh, delayed penalties. The whole thing going down that waterfall is scary. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, question for you, Steve. In terms of, um, so you, you know, we've obviously talked all a lot about kind of the, some of the stuff that's going on today. And you know, when when I go to events, conferences, right? You you talk to people, and everybody's extremely busy. Um, yet it's very challenging to do deals these days, right? Because I mean, if if you're looking at new airplanes, at, that's overly competitive, right? There's 80 bettors and it's, you know, it's, so it, it's when you start looking at kind of the economics, it's, it's hard to make sense of them. And then you go, so you start going down the line and you're like, all right, the midlife assets. Okay. Well, that's everybody's into that space as well. And then, well, let's, let's maybe look at like the end of life and parts. Okay. Well, everybody's in that space too. What about the engines? Well, everybody's there too. So it seems like everybody seems to be, you know, not, not to quote the movie, but kind of like everywhere, uh, everything everywhere all at once, right? I mean, it's kind of like everybody's just everywhere. So how, you know, as an organization, right, how do you look at the current environment and figure out how do we keep moving? How do we keep doing what we're doing? And how do we keep spending the money that we've got to spend? Um, because you know that if you, you can't really go back to your investor and go, look, yeah, it's really tough. So we're going to take a pass for now, but we want to make sure that that money's there when we need it, but like you know, hold on to it for us. That doesn't really play out, right? Because investors want to make money, so they want to return. So how do you how do you how do you look at that? Yeah, and and um, you know when you when you look at it, I mean, it's even worse when the investor's given you the money um, already, and you've got to go and deploy it. Um, you know, if you look at some of the structures that are out there, it's like, it's not, I can call the money when I need it. It's here. It's sitting on your balance sheet. You've got to go or in the bank. You've got to go invest it. Um, it, it really is a challenge. And, you know, again, looking at the totality of the market and in that secondary market in particular, the ABS market's been closed. But, you know, there's a couple of deals out there now. And maybe that's coming back. And, and what's that going to do to things? Because that's going to drive more competition, especially in that secondary market. You know, the structure of the ABS is, um, was very um, supportive of driving secondary market uh, deals up there. Um, uh, so we've been fortunate to be successful in a number of secondary bids, but they've either they've had some element of them that um, played into our hands. One, size matters, right? So uh, we're fortunate with the KKR capital that we, we can write a pretty large check. I mean, when you think of 22 um, 777s that uh, Etihad had and 16 A330s, those are big deals, which if you combine that with wide body, it's a big differentiator. You know, it, it's... You can't do those all day long because you've got to balance yourself out, obviously. But we have managed to do some some slightly larger deals in the in the secondary market, which is is good. Um, but the freight market is again something where we've had to to focus a lot of time, looking at how we can really we can realize more out of the residual because everybody's going to come through the door and know what an A three twenty is and know what you know. Viva Airbus is and, and, you know, and evaluate the credit. It's going to come down a lot to, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure the cheapness of the financing is a differentiator. I think it's under, coming back to the start, I said it's understanding that asset. So we, we spent a lot of time trying to think of where the arbitrages are. Um, you know, the, the, the freight conversion arbitrage um, uh, or, or, or risk manage, mitigant to management. Um, I mean, we're, we're struggling, uh, you know, as is everybody because of MRO capability, because of supply chain, etc. Um, we think that that 
is where certainly in the wide body space, there's going to be some opportunity sets if you look in three, four years time. You know, whether Boeing can get their act together and do the 7788F on time, you know, here we are. Um, we've not even got, um, you know, the, uh, the, the authority from Boeing to do the test, the TIA test to uh, TIA authority to actually go out and start testing the 777X yet. We're in t middle of 2024 and are we going to get deliveries of that in 25 or 26? How are they going to ramp up? So bot basically the 8F is, is a big undetermined piece of the wide body freight market. The 350 freighter seems to be something which is probably got some um, fallout from the 321 XLR certification type issues. So will that come in on time? Um, maybe not. Maybe the 350 success of the 350 packs market is going to curtail the number of 350 freighters that are produced. It's those sort of dynamics which lead us to say that if you fast forward three or four years, that's where I think the opportunity set may be for wide body freighters. And that's something we've played in all the time, uh, for a long time, uh, right from the, the BA DC 1030 fleet in, in, in 1998, which was the first ones that we did. It's those sort of plays we're looking at. We've stayed away from the narrow body freight conversion market because I think that was a lot of people reacting, saying, what the heck do I do with my single aisle airplane? Oh, let's convert it rather than looking at the, the demand side of it. Um, I, so we, we're looking very closely at demand supply. Why, bodies? We think that uh, there are elements of the traditional financing market, debt bank financing market for wide bodies in two, three years time, or even next year might start looking a little bit thinner. Um, and so I think there may be an opportunity set there where we can get into some wide bodies at the right price, even long-term wide bodies, um, and, and take that. Um, you know, we, we also think that there's going to be an, an arbitrage somewhere along the line with the 787 as a freight conversion potential. So we're, we're, we're looking at those spots to make a, uh, not a bet, but an investment today that gets us three or four years out and says, where do you go from there? It, it's covering those areas of either financial risk or technical risk um, or perceived technical risk of, of saying, not a lot of people will want a wide body with a three year lease expiry. You know, it, it doesn't appeal to the new entrants in the, in the market. Um, it's not the commodity guys. Um, and we're, we're also taking a view on the other side that the, the larger leasing companies are probably, probably not going to be, um, not going to be amenable to selling large portfolios when they're not getting additional new airplanes on time. So it's almost a negative saying, well, I don't think we'll get, we'll get supply from where we typically would have done. So we've got to go and create new supply somehow. Um, wide bodies, I think, and the freight market are probably where we grab a lot of our attention. Um, engines are on a unit price basis, probably not that attractive unless we could do a large pool of engines. Because if you're, if you're looking at deploying like KKR's latest allocation, $1.15 billion of equity, you don't really make a hole in, in, in that by doing an engine here or there. We might do it to support other strategies or with specific aircraft, but it may not be big enough from a deployment side of life to actually um, attract a lot of our attention. Yeah. I mean that, you know, it's, it's funny. You talk about kind of figuring out what's going to, what's going to happen next. Um, and that's something that, you know, Courtney and I do. I mean, that's what we talk about all the time. Right. Cause I mean, I, I we, we certainly feel like everybody's very good at saying what's going on today, what everybody knows, everybody's well, you know, very good at kind of regurgitating that. Uh, but from our standpoint, it's, it's trying to figure out, you know, what's going to happen next. Right. And I think that's kind of what, what you're talking about in terms of looking at, 
trends. We, we agree with you on the, on the wide body side. I think there's definitely opportunities just based on the fact that it's been underserved for such a long time. And you still have, I think, regions like China that, you know, where there's a huge amount of demand that's coming, that's going to be hard to fill. Um, because what, what do you go after? And we talked about that, you know, Courtney and I just before in terms of, you know, where, where do those airplanes come from? I mean, it's not, you know, they're not going to place a big Boeing order. That's for sure. So where, where does that, you know, where does that get filled? You've got a lot of A330s that are coming out and, um, and there's, I think there's still plenty of areas that are like that. Um, so it's, it's great. You know, it's kind of, it's always interesting to hear kind of how, how you're looking at that to be able to differentiate yourselves. Cause it's at the end of the day, um, you know, there's, there's fewer, I think, areas where you have to find those opportunities, right? Which is very challenging today. Yeah. And something that worries us is, you know, what comes next um, on the OEM side. Um, and it's not just the next generation of aeroplane, which obviously has a, a big dollar development budget to it when, you know, whether you're an engine OEM or uh, an airframe OEM, you probably don't have, well, you, Maybe you're not under the same ownership as you used to be. Maybe you don't have the same access to capital that you used to have. Or maybe your coffers have been emptied by, you know, what's happened. Um, you know, whether it's a Max or 787s or, or whatever like that. We start looking at that um, and saying, um, is it realistic to take the risk three or four years out that we're thinking about from a perspective of, we we see the engine OEMs changing their business model, and I think it's I think it's going to have a big impact on the support side of things. You know, I mean, it's hard to extract. I won't say impossible, but it's very hard to extract an MCPH program out of it on a CFM fifty six uh, CFM Leap engine today. Um, you know, you, you've seen what's happened on the GTF. Roles have changed their model. Not that they're impacting much on the Boeing side these days. I mean, 787s seem to be going towards the Gen X. But, you know, on the Airbus side, you know, there's not really that willingness to write those, um, you know, those support programs. And ultimately, there's less of an interest when the OEMs with these newer engines can't don't have the bunch of statistics, uh, historical statistics to write the probability um, matrix down there. So they're not willing to take the risk on a leap engine right now. Um, you're not willing to take the leap. Well, you have to on a GTF, but on a, on a Rolls engine, they're shying away from you know uh, from taking that risk. What does that do um, to the third party o uh, MRO market? Because if we're relying on that third party market in three or four years' time to be able to step up to what it's traditionally done it may be stepping into something different where the OEMs had previously been. So capacity-wise, pricing-wise, et cetera, we may be walking into a bus saw, or, or the industry could be walking into a bus saw of, you know, those dynamics are going to look different, um, you know, in three to four years' time. But fundamentally, I don't know how the industry can, can continue. If you, I think if you benchmark a 737, price line and in terms of inflation and everything else I, i'm not sure there's much been much real um increase in that over the years uh did that analysis and you're right there hasn't and, right and uh, well i take that back depends on how you look at it there's not been the increase in value right and in, inflation adjusted has decreased in value but the oems have harvested it by increased production Right? right. So the supply was was kind of increased. Obviously, that brought unit costs down and production went up faster than inflation to to keep the values there. But you, but you saw the other aspect of that is the OEMs on the engine side thought they had enough of clarity of data to say, OK, let's keep the the pricing lower and I'll just take my 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 money over time on 10 year mcph programs now you you don't have that visibility of reliable data when engines right. are coming off on the first run way early than planned so why would you underwrite that so that's an element that kind of suppressed the pricing as well um and now that 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 isn't necessarily going to be the case going forward certainly if you need to 
also generate cash to develop the next generation engine. Um, or as a, a to play devil's advocate there, because I you're right. If how are you going to develop the next generation of engine if you're just entering your cash burn period, right? Of the old business model of I lose money when I mount it on a new airplane and I make it through the life cycle of, of the engine. I think they're questioning that very seriously. So when Boeing and Airbus, and, and not on the current models, but when Boeing, Airbus, or I don't care, pick your favorite OEM here, comes to them and say, oh, by the way, I want to replace uh, the airplane that you're selling, that you're currently losing money on. Uh, I want to design, and, and I need you to invest a bunch of money to design the engine that's going to replace your engine before it's even into the into the money on your cycle. And the engine OEMs can very uh, easily, very powerfully say, "Yeah, no. Like, who else are you going to go and get? Like, there's there's nobody else." That's we've seen engine OEMs compete to be on aircraft programs in the past. That dynamic is now very different, right? Like you said, they won't even write engine uh, agreements today because they don't know what it's what it's going to be. So, how do you move forward with? you know, a, a new engine program without the profits, without the revenues. And that's tough. Well, I, I, the headlines out of IATA when Scott Kirby um, said, you know, we need to have a third manufacturer, um, you know. He's going to drive Embraer into the ground, I'm calling it. Right. but, but <laughs> They're going to bite on that and they'll kill him. And, and the, um, but in at least in his podcast over the weekend, you bit, or whenever it was published, um, he basically says, yeah, that's really not going to happen. You know, unless you get a Elon Musk is, is so pissed off with his lack of approval on his $50 billion pay package from the car industry, he's going to come in and start a, a airplane. He would do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but realistically, it's, it, it's not there. I mean, I think it's an intriguing dynamic of, you know, if you think of people, areas where people have stayed away from, I mean, I grew up in British aerospace. I saw from the inside what manufacturers of regional aircraft would do to put, place their product. And, and it wasn't very commercially sustainable or viable so that somebody could come in from the outside. Um, you know, it may just be that regional aircraft are somewhere where people start looking, you know, you, to, 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 to think about what, what are the alternatives? I mean, we've we've seen more people look at that. It's not big unit value, but right. on the other side of the equation, there's places like Japan with the exchange rate right now that the Japanese investor, the the yen don't go as far, and and they're actually they've actually been looking at regional airplanes and, and engines. So th there's a, there's some little quirks there that will get you into there, but it's not big enough to say. That somebody's going to come in and change the the OEM dynamic. I don't think in the near term. I think it's I'm a regional guy. I swear I live and breathe eleven years at Bombardier, so that's the space I live in. And yet, I can very easily uh, recognize that it's an order of magnitude smaller, and that creates problems. Yeah. Right. Just to from the capital side, but control a supplier base, compete for the same supplier base that Boeing and Airbus are relying on. I'm sorry, but you fall off the bottom at the first, at the first hiccup. Um, you know, as, as we've seen, um, you know, but you know, uh, again, if I, so let's, let's play out the Embraer situation. Oh, we want to build a new, a big new airplane. Uh, great. Let's go find an engine for it. GE's like, you know what? We've got one. It's called the leap. Yeah. What's that going to do for you, right? Yeah. Or, or granted, there are there are engine programs being considered, but the money has not been put there. That's that's the big, that's kind of the big question. For which, if I'm in Breyer, then, and not to put words in their mouth, but here's what I would say, Scott, you've got the third OEM. We've got one nine five E twos that, by the way, are sitting on your contract, your scope contract, ready to go right now. I'll give you a discount. Right, it's there. Yeah. Your your third option is there. Fourth option, if I'm being fair to myself. <laughs> yeah, and and I think you know the Embraer side of life of going and, and and building a new airplane in the 
A320 737 size like I mean you run to Japan and talk to Mitsubishi and you know mm -hmm. I've been there done that and it didn't go too well um, and it wasn't well it was regional but um, uh, and then or then you go to Saudi Arabia because they're a big provider of you know cash liquidity it just seems like there's too many pieces that have got to come together as well as you're saying you know what are the industry participants prepared to do whether it's engine or it's just a, a step too far on so many levels, but um, I but and Embraer is incredibly capable. Like, oh, do there, totally. there is no OEM today that's delivering airplanes <laughs> on time, right? So there's there's that. So it's not a question of it's not a question of that. It's the realities of the dynamics of the industries that we're in, and the engine OEMs, to your point, are a huge part. A, a driving part almost in that yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean definitely when you when you look at the engine space right now i mean I, you know i feel like all of the oem all of the engine oems are trying to find ways to de-risk themselves based mm -hmm. on the situation that they put themselves into right it's almost like they're going look yeah a power of the hour programs flight hour whatever you want to call them like that's a thing of the past we're really not interested in that we'll sell you all the parts that you want Absolutely. You want you like go do it. But you know what? You're on your own. It's time is material. Like we don't want to tell you, yes, we'll we'll cover the engine. We'll do it for X amount because we don't know what that X amount is going to be. And we don't want that risk. Right. Unfortunately, they're tied into a lot of previously agreed to contracts. Um, but you said, as you said, going forward. Right. How does that change? Right. How do they look at that differently to be able to go? We're not going to make that mistake again because it's not paying off right now. It might pay off down the road because, you know, we'll start to see kind of people needing parts and, you know, things will kind of start normalizing a little bit. But, like, we're not so, going to build another engine based on that model. So you've got the OEMs today who basically, and coming back to that, this is a comment based on that. Um, you've got the OEMs today who, I mean, they don't let, the lessors darken their doors because basically they don't need them. You know, they're sold out. You know, you know. Even though Jerry Ladham is retiring, you know, he said, you know, sell me the airplanes, don't sell them to you know to um, to the leasing companies. And and so a lot of business models were built on visible growth by order backlogs, and you know, and, and in the leasing side of life, um, that's not there right now. So then you look around and say, what's the next step? The new, next new technology airplane. Um, you know, uh, the, we, we, we as a leasing community, because we're not like the airlines, we're not hands-on, you know, maintaining things or whatever, and we probably don't have as much leverage as the airlines. We, we definitely don't have as much leverage as the airlines. But what do you think the reaction is going to be when – Somebody comes through the door and says, with the technological risk we've all seen collapse around us in the last decade, the next new aeroplane, and by the way, there's no MCPH program. There's nothing you can sign up to to hedge that. I mean, the leasing community is just going to turn around and say, why would I take that risk? Um, you know, so my point is the OEMs have lost a chunk of what would have been their market because I don't see the leasing community taking that risk, or, or or the engine OEMs, or the maybe even the airframe OEMs being prepared to step up to the the recourse that is going to be needed for that new new airplane. Well, so imagine if airlines, lessors, as a matter, were forced to pay for the value of the aircraft, right? If if they actually charged the full price of the engines if engine oems actually made money on delivery imagine what the price of those new aircraft would be i mean it would it changes the whole the whole equation well yeah then then you can put a higher residual and everything you've got yeah that's a good point <laughs> you know so then your portfolio your existing portfolio you're sitting there fat dumb and happy because it just increased 20 percent. you're right <laughs> you know, th th that's where you end up saying this i mean we see a lot of talk about um, what's the uh, what impact are you talking about on on lease renewals, for instance, um, right now? 
you know, we, like everybody else, are seeing airlines want to either extend existing leases, uh, so you know, to hedge against everything that's going on out there, or own aircraft, you know, buy the aircraft at the end of the lease. And we, we as a leasing community, are we, are, this is a question: Are we going to be forced, or are we going to logically have to um, rely on the airlines? striking the deal with the OEMs on the next technology aeroplane and getting everything out, out of them. Is is there a slot for us as a leasing industry on speculatively ordering the next technolo new technology aeroplane as an industry? That's, yeah, that's a, a big, great question. That's a big risk, right? I mean... Is it, right? is it, is it one we can afford? Is it one we can have other means of mitigating? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's something in our mind, you know, we're, we're not at the leading edge of ordering a new technology aeroplane that's coming out in 2035, so don't get me wrong. But the industry is a, has to think about how that, that approaches it, the leasing industry. Yeah, and, 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 I, I, and I think those the... that can get past that and actually take that leap, no pun intended in the, yeah. the current technology stuff, but um, I think that could pay off. Right, because as you say, there's not going to be a lot of people that are going to be going. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, look, how many lessors are putting spec orders today? Right, because it doesn't make sense today. Because you're going, well, I, I can't get it for another eight years. And right. then what's the pricing I'm going to get then? Because it's my pricing is not going to be as good as the airline side. Why would I even want to do that? So if you're talking about somebody launching an airplane in, you know, one, two, three, four years, that's not going to be available for another ten. Yeah, who's going to make that bet? Um, but I think if you, you know. I think what will probably happen over the next three to five years will be a great guideline for what to expect going forward. As you say, like how will the engine OEMs change, right? How will the the you know the the airframe OEMs change to be able to say, look, yeah, I think we'll be okay with the next airplane, and if we're in it at the at the forefront, we'll do better than everybody else, right? But how do you get past that, and how do you get your investors or shareholders to to jump on that by saying, hey, trust me? Right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Everybody's so. all excited about Boeing should be building the next thing and what's the next airplane program to come out. They haven't finished the last program. And I don't mean like I don't mean like finished delivering. I mean finished developing it. Yeah. That's and then what do you do? Right? I we've missed I think as an industry the element of time. We're not including the idea that we're not gonna get fifteen percent every ten years. Like no. we Snuck this last one out because of the engine OEMs, right? They delivered it and they know they delivered it, right? That's the other problem too. They know, they know they delivered the most value out of the out of the last out of the last round. So who's going to be willing to throw money down? By the way, on a technology, we're not even sure what fuel it's going to burn yet. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be doing hydrogen. We're going to be doing what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Steve, look, we're we're on the uh, hour and a half mark. I know we we know you're you've got other things to do as well um so we won't we won't keep you on but uh i did want to thank you this has been fantastic we really appreciate all of your your thoughts in terms of how you got to where you are today uh and it's great to see all the successes you've had you know certainly look forward to hearing about the continued success that you'll have with you and your team but uh, we do appreciate your time today and, and talking with us well, thanks for that. Uh, maybe some jumbled thoughts in there. Maybe a, a, a strand of something that makes sense when you you, you look back over it. But uh, it's been fun. Um, uh, I've had a smile on my face for an hour and a half, and uh, and that's what it's all about, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, come on, ask for more than that. This industry is special, um, and long may it stay that way. Um, yeah, I'm I'm certainly glad that I found my way through luck and good fortune to where where we are today yeah Very and we're good. glad too because then we got to talk to you about it so that <laughs> that's even better that's even better so thanks again steve thank you so steve this is your time on wing Hello. You done? God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was checking the old emails. <laughs>